access your free language gifts right now before they expire. First, the Having a Party PDF Cheat Sheet. With this cheat sheet, you'll learn words and phrases like, would you like a drink, guest, dessert, and more. Second, must know phrases for rejecting invitations. This one minute lesson will teach you phrases like, sorry, I already have plans, I'm tired, and more. Third, summer plans conversation lesson. Go travel, relax at the beach, stay at home and sit on the internet. You'll learn how to say these and other summer plans in your target language. Fourth, must know Father's Day vocabulary. Can you say Father's Day in your target language? You'll be able to with this quick one minute vocabulary lesson. Fifth, the summer season writing workbook. With this printable PDF, you'll learn all the must know summer words and phrases. And you'll be able to practice writing the phrases out as well. Download it for free right now. And sixth, tired of apps that just teach you random words? With our innovative language learning app, you learn through conversations and start speaking in minutes because our conversation lessons are just three to 15 minutes long. Learning is that easy. Download it for free for the Android, iPhone, and iPad. To get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. <laughs> Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Djibril, DJ Abril. I'm sorry if I said your name incorrectly. I hope that's okay. DJ Abril asks, being childish, what does it mean? For example, sorry, it was childish of me. Okay, so childish, yeah. So to act in a childish way or to be childish means to act similar to a child. So we use this ish, this I-S-H, to mean something like the noun that comes before it. So in this case, childish means like a child or in the same manner as a child. So when someone tells you as an adult, you're being childish or he's acting childish, it means that person is acting in the same manner as a child. The idea here is that that person is immature or they're doing something that seems like it's not appropriate for an adult to do. So for example, if you're at work and someone at your job starts having a temper tantrum, which means that they get really, really upset and they just start demanding things, they ask for things, and they just want somebody to like help them or give them attention or whatever, you might describe that person as being childish. They cannot control their emotions or they're making requests that are unreasonable. So when we see somebody acting in a way that is not appropriate for their age, when they see somebody that is acting similar to the way a child acts, we can call them childish. So that's the key with the word childish. It's referring to someone that is acting in a manner similar to a child. Here are a couple more examples. My coworker was acting so childish today. Uh, my roommates are so childish, they never clean up after themselves. Okay, so I hope that this helps you understand the word childish. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Al Hassan Kohli. Hello, Al Hassan. Al Hassan says, what is the difference between questioning and interrogation? Ooh, nice question. Okay, so let's take a look at these two as nouns, questioning as a noun and interrogation as a noun. So first let's look at questioning because I know that ing at the end there might seem kind of confusing. We can use question as a verb as well, yes, but I want to focus on using questioning as a noun in this example situation. So questioning refers to asking someone a formal set of questions. Usually it's because there's some kind of problem, like some kind of legal trouble, maybe there's been a police involved situation, and someone needs to ask someone else some very formal questions. There's some kind of like system that they have for asking this person questions. This is called questioning. So for example, the police brought him in for questioning or questioning will begin tomorrow at noon. So in these example situations, there's a formal series of questions that someone is going to ask someone else about usually some kind of serious problem or serious situation. So for example, with the police, they might ask questions about a theft maybe, or maybe there was a fight and the police need to ask somebody about the details of the fight. When they do that, they refer to that as questioning. 
So as a noun, even with that ing form, this is how we use the word questioning. Let's compare this now to interrogation. So interrogation is very similar to questioning in that someone is asking someone else, oh, like a system, a series of questions about some very serious event. However, interrogation usually sounds much more serious. It can also sound very, very aggressive too. And usually the results or the effects of that situation are more serious. So in the questioning examples that I gave earlier, it was like a police questioning or maybe a company questioning if there was some problem or some situation that required attention. These situations are serious, yes, but generally when someone is asked about them, it's not like a life or death situation. Situation. It's not super serious, but it is important. Interrogation, on the other hand, it sounds kind of like something that maybe top level lawyers are used to do, or the results of it are extremely serious, like lots of money is involved, or maybe politics is involved, or maybe they're spies or something like that. So the idea with interrogation is it's very serious and sometimes very aggressive. Maybe you've seen in action movies too that in interrogation situations, maybe there's some kind kind of torture or horrible things that happen to the person that is being asked all these questions. So the idea is that the person asking the questions wants to make the other person very, very uncomfortable by like hurting them or maybe saying awful things to them and so on. These can also be parts of the interrogation process. So again, you're asking a series of questions, usually some kind of system or something like that is used to ask these questions from someone. But kind of the seriousness, the level level of importance is quite different generally with questioning and with interrogation. So this is really the key difference between questioning and interrogation. Questioning is asking someone some questions about something that happened that is probably important and serious. And interrogation, the level of seriousness is much higher. And sometimes it can be more aggressive and just generally a, a lot more important than just questioning. So I hope that this helps you understand the differences between questioning and interrogation. Thanks very much for an interesting question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Bhavna Singh. Hi, Bhavna. Bhavna says, hi, Alicia. What is the meaning of big picture? Okay, nice question. Yeah, big picture. So of course, this expression does not simply mean a picture that is very big. We have the expression big picture in English. We use it in sentences like, look at the big picture or think about the big picture here. So what does this big picture mean? Big picture means look at the situation or think about the situation, not just in terms of the small details, but look at everything happening in this situation. So we use the expression big picture in this way. It might help you to understand this expression to think about maybe a big picture or a big painting. If we focus on one small part of the painting, maybe we can see brush strokes, we can see the parts where the artist changed colors, we can see maybe very small details of something, but if we focus only on one small part of the painting, we can only see that part, right? So when somebody says, look at the big picture or think about the big picture, it's saying, don't think so much about the details of something or don't look so much at the details. Kind of take a step back and think about everything in this situation. So when we say, look at the big picture, it's like you're maybe focusing so much on the details. Just try to think about the whole situation. So for example, if you're looking for a new apartment, maybe, and you're really, really focused on like the cabinets in the apartment or something, even though it's a beautiful place and you say, oh, I love this place, but the cabinets are just not my style. Your friend might say, look at the big picture. This is a great apartment and you can always change the cabinets. No big deal. So this is kind of a silly example situation, but people might use the expression, look at the big picture or think about the big picture if you're a little bit too focused on the details of something or if they think it's good for you just to kind of take a step back and think about the whole situation. So I hope this helps you understand the expression big picture picture. Thanks very much for sending your question in. Okay, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe.
Let's get to the first question this week. First question this week comes from Yehuda. Hi, Yehuda. I hope I said your name correctly. Yehuda says, is it possible to speak English with a 100% American accent that people won't be able to detect? And if so, how do I achieve this? Thanks in advance. <laughs> Good question, Yehuda. My answer to this question would be no. It's not possible to speak with a 100% American accent because there isn't really such a thing as a 100% perfect American English accent. Why do I say this? I say this because actually in the USA there are many different types of American accent. People from one region of the USA speak a little bit differently than people from another region of the USA. I have a slightly different style of English speaking than my American coworkers do. So that's why I say that it's not possible to have a 100% perfect accent because depending on the place that you come from in the USA, you don't have the same accent as somebody else from a different part of the USA. USA. And also inside these different ways of speaking, there are different vocabulary word choices. Sometimes there are different grammar choices. There are just so many different ways that we can speak English and that we can speak American English that we can't just have one perfect 100% American accent. So that's the reason that I say that it's not possible to have that because in my mind there is no such thing as the one perfect accent. <laughs> so instead, I would suggest that you focus your studies on maybe finding somebody that sounds like the person you want to sound like. If that's me or if that's another YouTube page or another blogger or whatever, doesn't matter. But maybe find somebody that speaks in a manner that you think is something that's going to work for you. So I can't say for anybody out there who that perfect person is. It's up to you to make that decision. But keep in mind that everybody has a slightly different way of speaking. You probably have a certain way that you speak in your country or in your hometown or in maybe even your neighborhood or even in your house. Some families have their own kind of words that they use as well. So these are all things to keep in mind and just keep in mind as well that there's no such thing as the most perfect accent ever. So I guess I'll finish my answer to this question by just sharing some general tips for working on your pronunciation. One I already mentioned, looking for someone that you think is kind of the person that you would like to try to sound like. So some things that you can do to work on your pronunciation by yourself are of course to repeat after the person. So if for example you're using videos of me speaking, that means you can use my videos by shadowing. So that means speaking quickly after me. And you can turn on the captions as well on the videos to read the words that I'm saying if it's difficult for you to catch everything when you're listening. So you can use the scripts, you can use captions, scripts in your listening materials, and try to repeat quickly after the person so that you can get what's called shadowing practice. That's one way to do some pronunciation practice. So another thing that's really, really important to do is to check the way that you sound when you're practicing pronunciation. So it's really hard to understand the way that we sound when we're speaking, right? We can't hear our own voice really when we're speaking. So you can get around this and practice this by recording your Yourself. So I've recommended this many times on this channel, but try recording yourself speaking, recording yourself shadowing after someone else with your phone, with another recording device, and listen to that later. So you can compare the way you said the sentence or the phrase or the vocabulary word with the native speaker that you're trying to mimic, right? So if you listen to yourself, you can hear the parts that are good and the parts that are not so good, and then you practice the parts that aren't so good until they're better, right? So this is something that I know makes a lot of people feel really, really uncomfortable, and of course I understand. The first time you listen to your own voice, you think, oh my gosh, is that really what I sound like? I sound terrible. We all have that feeling, but remember, this recording is just for you. You don't have to share it with anybody. You listen to it in your house quietly alone. You don't have to tell anybody about the recording. You listen to it, check the parts that are good and the parts that aren't so good, and then move forward with your practice, right? So you don't have to put this on YouTube or anything like that. Don't worry about that part. It's just for you and it's just to help you work on your pronunciation. So that is another thing that can help a lot. You might be really surprised too when you listen to yourself, you'll probably hear some things that you've never heard before and go, oh my gosh, I have to work on that. So this is a really, really valuable thing you can do to work on your pronunciation. So I hope that this tip helps you. Like I said, don't try to think of like the 100% perfect American accent. Don't, don't try to think of that. Instead, try to think about somebody that you would like to sound 
sound like. So to wrap this up, I would say just focus on trying to find somebody that you like, someone whose voice you like or someone whose manner of speaking sounds nice to you, and maybe focus your attention on that person instead of just trying to make this 100% perfect American accent, because it doesn't really exist. If you want to have kind of a guideline for maybe some interesting people to listen for, you could try looking up like news announcers, maybe news announcers on big news networks. Those people might have a very clear manner of speaking. Speaking. But again, the way that we speak in these kinds of videos and the way that we speak in news presentations and the ways that we speak in everyday life are a little bit different. But those might be some places that you can start if you're looking for some inspiration for your speaking and pronunciation practice. But again, make sure that you also find ways to check yourself. And pronunciation practice with a recording device is one way that you can do that. So I hope that this helps you out. Thanks very much for your question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Yasser. Yasser Alexander. Hi, Yasser. Yasser says, what is the difference between pharmacy and drugstore? Nice question. Yeah, okay. Let's start with pharmacy. A pharmacy, pharmacy is the word we use in American English. A pharmacy is a place where you can go to get prescription drugs, prescription medications. So what is a prescription? When you go to the doctor for an illness or for a problem and visit the doctor and the doctor tells you to take medicine, they will usually give you a prescription, what's called a prescription. So it's some information about a medicine on a piece of paper and you take this to the pharmacy. So the pharmacy is the place where they change the doctor's orders into medication and you can pick up your medicine there. So the pharmacy is the place specifically for this. There's a specialist that works inside the pharmacy that knows the different drugs and has all of the authority to give people the correct medication. So this is a pharmacy. So a drugstore then is kind of like the store around the pharmacy. So what does that mean? In a lot of American cities, there are drugstores that have kind of daily life goods inside them, not like a supermarket. A drugstore tends to have things that we use around the house, like maybe shampoo and conditioner and cleaning items and various little small things that you need for your home and for your lifestyle. We sometimes also have like kind of snacks or maybe you might find like a sandwich, kind of light meals, those kinds of things. So inside a lot of drugstores, drugstores is a pharmacy. So I think that we call them drugstores because you can also buy just general drugs inside them. So for example, if you have a cold or if you have a headache, you can find just very, very basic medicine there, which you can't generally buy at supermarkets. So I think that's why we call them drugstores. But lots of drugstores have a pharmacy inside. So if you need to get special medicine, special medication from your doctor, you can go to the pharmacy inside the drugstore and pick it up. So this is the difference between a pharmacy and a drugstore. A drugstore has generally a lot of other lifestyle goods inside it and a pharmacy has just the medication. You may also see places that are just pharmacies outside of drugstores as well. So another interesting point to note is that pharmacy is the American English word that we use for this. You might hear the British English uh, speakers around you using the word chemist for something similar. So this is another interesting difference between British English and American English. But this is the difference between pharmacy and drugstore in the US. To finish, here are a couple of super quick examples with both of these words. I took my prescription to the pharmacy. Can you please pick up my prescription from the pharmacy? And with drugstore, let's go to the drugstore real quick before we leave for the picnic. Ah, I have such a bad cold. I should get some medicine from the drugstore. Great, so those are a couple of super quick examples. And both of these words are very commonly used in everyday communication in everyday life. So thanks very much for sending your question along. I hope that helps. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Beverly Sabrina Adrian. Hi, Beverly, I hope I said your name correctly. Beverly says, hi, Alicia. I would like to know if there is a difference between clock in and check in, and also clock out and check out. Thank you. Mm, interesting question. This kind of depends a little bit on the situation. There are some cases in which we only use check-in or check-out, and there are some cases where we could use both. So first, let's talk about the situation I can think of where we would use both of these. 
If you come to the office, if you have a job that requires you to mark your start time and your end time at the beginning and at the end of work, you could use either clock in or check in. This might depend a little bit on the company. Generally, you could probably use both of these phrasal verbs to describe that. So for example, when you arrive at work, you might say, I clocked in at nine o'clock or I checked in at nine o'clock. You could use both of them. I would say we probably tend to use clock in more, but again, depending on the company, depending on the organization, maybe there are some places that use check in in this case. So it's kind of up to the organization or the company. And on the other hand, when you leave or when you finish work, you could say, I clocked out at 5 p.m. or I checked out at 5 p.m. Again, I think that we would probably use clock out more for a work situation, but again, there may be some places that use check out as well. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about some situations in which we definitely do not use clock in or clock out. We only use check in and check out in these situations. For example, when you go to a hotel, you will always check in to the hotel when you arrive and you will check out of the hotel when you leave. We do not use clock in or clock out in this case. You might also use check in and check out when you're going to a place that is used by a lot of other different people that are not connected to each other. So by that I mean, for example, like a health club, a gym, some kind of fitness area, perhaps even some kind of massage room. So these are all places that lots of people are coming and going from, right? And they're not connected they're not co-workers or friends, but it's important to keep a record of those people. So in these situations, we use check-in and check-out to mark the time that someone came and the time that someone left. Again, we tend to use clock-in and clock-out for these kind of regular activities, usually at work. Depending on the organization, some places might prefer to use check-in and check-out, but I would say that, at least in American English, we generally use clock-in and clock-out more for our work situations, and check-in, check-out for like hotel and fitness clubs and other kind of temporary use situations. So I hope that this answers your question about the differences between check-in, check-out, and clock-in and clock-out. Thanks very much for sending it along. Okay, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Kenji Kumaki. Hi, Kenji. Kenji says, I want to know the differences between as long as and as far as. I always think about how to use these two phrases when I talk to someone. Okay, as long as and as far as. So first, there is the basic comparison meaning, as long as. So A is as long as B, and A is as far as B. I'm not going to talk about those, the basic comparison ones. Rather, I'm going to talk about these expressions as part of other expressions. So let's first introduce a couple of examples sentences we can use to talk about the differences between these two. Let's start with as long as. So we use as long as as part of a sentence that expresses a condition. So for example, as long as I finished work at six o'clock, I can come to the movie with you. So another way of expressing this idea is only if I finish work at six o'clock can I come to the movie with you. So as long as expresses this only if condition. As far as, on the other hand, is used in different situations. We use as far as in expressions like as far as I know or as far as I'm aware, which means to the extent that I'm aware or to the extent of my knowledge. So you can see that these two expressions are used very differently. We don't use as far as to talk about a condition like we do with as long as. We use as far as to express the limitations of something. So we use as far as most commonly in these kinds of expressions that describe our personal limitations. Like as far as I know or as far as I'm aware or as far as I've heard these kinds of things that express the limits of our knowledge or maybe in some cases the limits of our abilities. So as far as is used in this way to express that limitation or another way to express this or another way to understand this is like saying to the extent that I am aware or to the best of my 
my knowledge. That's kind of another way to express this idea. So with as far as, we're usually talking about the extent or the limitation of our knowledge or our ability or the information that we have. So as far as is used in expressions like as far as I know and as far as I'm aware to express the limitations of our knowledge, to express that maybe there's some possibility that things are different from the current situation, but based on the information I have, this is what I think or this is what I'm going to do. So this is what we use as far as to do. On the other hand, when we use as long as, we're expressing some kind of condition. So A is possible only if B is possible. That's what we use as long as to do. So one more example sentence with as long as might be something like, hmm, as long as the weather's sunny tomorrow, we can go to the beach. So again, this expresses that condition, right? As long as it's sunny tomorrow is our condition. Only if A is possible. Only if it's sunny tomorrow, is it okay or is it possible to go to the beach? So I hope this answers your question about the differences between as long as and as far as. As long as expresses that only if condition and as far as expresses a kind of limitation or the extent of usually our knowledge or the information we have available. Also, as I mentioned very briefly at the beginning of this answer, we can also use these to make comparisons like A is as long as B and A is as far as B. But I'm guessing your question is about the other uses that I talked about in this answer. So thanks very much for sending this question along. I hope that helps you. Okay, let's move along to your next question. Next question comes from Meijan. I hope I said your name correctly. Meijane, I hope I said it correctly. Uh, Meijan says, please explain how to use defensive and offensive. Okay, great question. So defensive versus offensive. Let's first talk a little bit about sports. So if you're playing a game, if you're playing a sport in which you have a ball, let's say for example soccer, and you have the ball, your responsibility is to defend, right? So you want to keep the ball, right? You want to keep the ball and so you're going to do everything you can with your team to make sure you protect the ball, right? And of course, score a goal. The other team, on the other hand, they want to do everything they can to get the ball, right? They want to get the ball and use it to score a goal. They are the offensive team. So we call that the offense or the offensive team. So what's interesting about these words is that we don't just use them to talk about sports and to talk about war and fighting and battles and these kinds of things. We also use these words to talk about our communication. So we sometimes say that someone is on the defensive or they're on the offensive when they start to attack someone else with their words or when they're trying to defend themselves with their words. So for example, if you have a fight with your roommate, your roommate is maybe angry with you because you didn't wash the dishes or something like that. They might say something like, you never do the dishes, I'm always the one cleaning up out here. We could describe that person as going on the offensive. They're the one that is attacking you in this case. You, on the other hand, are on the defensive side. You want to defend yourself, protect yourself. You can say, I'm so sorry, I've been really busy lately, or I just forgot, I apologize, I'll take care of it next time. So you are defending yourself. So we have this defense and offense in our communication as well. It does sound a little bit like sports or maybe like an official battle, like a fight in a wartime situation, but we also use these defensive and offensive words to refer to other situations where we need to protect ourselves or where we need to attack or go after something. So you might also hear offensive being used when someone does something aggressively. Like for example, if a guy sees a cute girl at a bar and he really, really, really wants to talk to her, he might go up and introduce himself and try to make some light chit chat or something like that. And his friends might say like, oh, he's on the offensive. So that means like he's trying to get something. That's kind of the feel with offensive. So you can kind of imagine that there are many different communication related situations in which we might use defensive and offensive to communicate that idea. Okay, to finish this answer, there's one more really interesting point that I want to make, and it's about the word offensive. So you might notice the pronunciation is a little bit different. I've been talking about being on the defensive or on the offensive. Generally, when we talk about sports, we say like he's on the offense, right? So that's the pronunciation we often use to talk about the offense, the side that's attacking. But there's another word that is offensive. So it has the same spelling, right? But the pronunciation of this word is always 
offensive. So this word means something is disgusting or something causes us to feel very, very strongly in a bad way. So for example, if someone makes a really rude comment, you might say, that's offensive. Or if you smell something that is absolutely terrible, you might say, oh, that is an offensive smell. So offensive means it's something that's like attacking your senses or it's attacking your own personality maybe. So we have this word that means that something is really, really terrible, but the pronunciation is always offensive. You might have noticed earlier, yeah, I said offense, offense, but we also have an overlapping pronunciation here. So we always have to use this offensive pronunciation when we talk about things that are offensive. This is an adjective. We can also use this pronunciation when we want to describe someone on the attack, like, oh, he's on the offensive. We can use that a uh sound at the beginning of this word. However, we cannot use the ah uh pronunciation with the adjective. So we cannot say that something is offensive. We always say that something is offensive. So this is a really small pronunciation point, but make sure that when you're talking about attacking someone or attacking something, you can use both pronunciations. Both are okay, though I would say that the aw pronunciation is more natural. So just keep in mind that if you want to say that something is offensive and it's not good, you should make sure to use that a uh pronunciation. It's offensive. If you want to talk about sports or the attacking side in a situation, you can say they're on the offense or on the offense. Both are okay. So this is an interesting pronunciation point, but just keep in mind you can only say that something is offensive, not offensive. So I hope this helps answer your question about the differences between defensive and offensive. We also talked a bit about defense and offense and related words too. Thanks so much for sending this question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Sum Yin Wang. Hi, Sum Yin Wang. Sum Yin Wang says, hi, Alicia. I want to know the differences between vegan and vegetarian. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Okay, and a very important thing to know in this day and age. The distinction, to the best of my knowledge, is very, very simple. Let's start with vegetarian. So a vegetarian is a person that does not eat meat. So no pork, no chicken, no beef, nothing. So some people might say, I'm a vegetarian, but I eat some fish. Those people are sometimes described as pescatarians. But I think that some people consider true vegetarians to be people who also do not eat fish. So no red meat, no fish. That is someone who is a vegetarian. A vegan, on the other hand, or a meal that is vegan, is a meal that uses no animal products at all. So when I say animal products, I mean, of course, meat and fish, but also things that come from animals. So for example, that means dairy. So like milk, yogurt, cheese, butter, that means eggs as well. So things that come from animals are also not consumed by people who are vegan. So people who are vegan do not consume any animal products at all. Or maybe some people who are vegan decide just to do it every once in a while. It's up to individual preference of course, and people who are vegetarian simply do not eat meat. So this is the simplest breakdown of the differences between vegan and vegetarian. Last point for this answer is that it's possible to use vegan and vegetarian to describe people and to describe the food that we eat. So I could say, I'm a vegetarian or I'm a vegan. You could also say, this dish is vegetarian or this dish is vegan. So that means it doesn't have meat or it doesn't have any animal products. So we can use these words to talk about the people, to describe the person's choices, or we can use it to talk about the foods that we eat. So I hope this helps you understand the differences between vegan and vegetarian. Thanks very much for sending this question along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Aster Fleury. Hi Aster. Aster says, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, wrote this. From making electric vehicles easier to buy and easier to charge, to putting a price on pollution across the country, to helping industries adopt clean technologies, we've done a lot to tackle climate change. My question is, why did he use verbs in the progressive tense with to, like to pudding and to helping? 
If he would have used to put or to help in this sentence, what would have been the meaning? Yeah, great question. Okay, so we need to break down what's happening in this part of this speech. So actually, what Prime Minister Trudeau is doing in these few sentences is he's describing a range of activities. So you notice in the very first sentence, he says, from making electric vehicles, blah, 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 blah. And then the next point is to putting, and then we have to helping, and so on. Um, what he's doing here is he's describing a series of activities. We often do this with this from A to B construction. So this is a very long example of this, but that's actually what he's doing here. So in a very, very simple situation, we use from A to B to talk about a range of things or maybe a range of services. So to give a different example, a very short example sentence of this, we might say that store sells everything from electronic goods to home goods. So that expresses a range. So this store sells lots and lots of different things things. In this example sentence, Trudeau is doing the same thing with this from to pattern, but those noun phrases are much longer. So now that we understand why we have this from to pattern we use to express a range, and he adds an extra range with another to statement, now let's look at why we see these ing verb forms here. So one thing we can do by putting this ing form of a verb is we can create a noun form form or a noun phrase out of this. So for example, you probably have thought about the difference between like, I like to hike and I like hiking, right? So hiking in that example sentence is a noun. We use this as a noun. This ing form can be used as a noun. So what Trudeau has done in this speech is he has created noun phrases by using this ing form of the verb at the beginning. So let's break this down. Let's look at each part of this. So Trudeau begins his from to range statement with from making electric vehicles easier to buy and easier to charge. So this is a noun phrase, making electric vehicles easier to buy. So this is one action. We can understand this as one action the Canadian government has done here. And then the next part, to putting a price on pollution across the country. So this is another activity, right? Another noun phrase, to putting a price on pollution. That's an activity. And the third one, helping industries adopt clean technologies. This is the third item. So by creating these noun phrases with the ing form of the word, he's showing a range of things the government has done. So that's the two parts that are actually happening here. So we have this from A to B pattern, and he's extended that. He's Made that longer by adding one more to from A to B to C to show that he did many things as part of the Canadian government. And he's using noun phrases, very long noun phrases, after this. So he's basically expressing the different activities the Canadian government has done in order to tackle climate change. So that's what's happening in this sentence here. You can do the same thing when you want to express a range of activities or a series of steps for something. Use that from A to B pattern and for more emphasis you can add a to C pattern too and just add those noun phrases after that from this thing to that thing to that other thing. Trudeau is doing the same thing here. They're just very, very long. So I hope this helps you understand what's happening in this sentence and also helps you understand why that ing verb form is used here. So thanks so much for sending along this really interesting question. I hope that that helps you. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Miriam. Hi, Miriam. Miriam says, hi, Alicia. Hi, Miriam. I'm Miriam, and I would like to ask this question. I'm not good in English, especially my writing skills. They are zero. I tried really hard to improve it, but it doesn't work. I want you to please give me some tips. How can I improve? Thanks. Okay, first point, Miriam, you wrote me this message, so that's clear. That makes it very clear. You have some skills, right? You were able to communicate your question to me. You were able to share about your experience very clearly. I understood it, no problem. And you were able to talk about your goal. So that shows you already have some writing skills, right? So the things that I would suggest to work on improving your writing skills, there are a few things to do. Uh, maybe the first thing to do would be to set yourself a very small goal. So if you think, oh, I don't know how to improve, I don't know what to do, 
try thinking about something you want to do, some kind of target for your writing skills. So for example, you could think of writing this message as a kind of goal. You were able to write this message and communicate your idea, right? So maybe think of another type of writing goal. So maybe you want to write a letter to ask for a product from a company, or maybe you want to write a letter to a friend in another country that speaks English, for example. So try to think of kind of some small goals. If you can't think of a goal outside yourself, maybe try to think about a goal you can do just alone. For example, writing in a journal every day or a diary, or maybe writing like tweets if you use Twitter or something like that. Maybe try setting a small goal for yourself, like, oh, I'm going to write about my day every day in a journal, something like that. So having a goal for yourself can help you kind of work on finding the words you need to study and finding out the steps that you need to take to achieve that goal, right? So for example, if your goal is to write to a company to order a product or something like that, you need to think about the vocabulary words, you need to think about kind of the ways to ask for something politely, to make a request, to provide your own information, and so on, right? So try setting a couple of goals for yourself. Like you say here, like, oh, I'm trying to work on my writing skills, but nothing helps me. Maybe think about what you want to do with your writing skills. That might be one thing that can help you to start. Uh, if you're just kind of out of ideas generally though, some things that you can do are copying as well. I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, it sounds a little bit crazy, but you can sometimes work on your writing skills just by copying interesting sentences that you find online in news articles and so on. Because it forces you to stop and think, like why did they use this grammar point here? What is this vocabulary word? You kind of slow down. Right? When we read things, we kind of take it in and it just kind of gets like really blurred and we don't know, maybe we don't think carefully about what we're reading. So sometimes writing can be a really helpful way, just copying something can be a helpful way to think carefully about how the sentence is made and why this vocabulary word was chosen and these kinds of things. So those are two quick things, uh, copying and setting a goal for yourself. Um, the third thing I would suggest is maybe just do a little bit of grammar review. If you're feeling like you don't have a whole lot of confidence in your writing skills, that might be just a little bit of uncertainty about grammar. Like, when should I use this grammar point? When should I use that grammar point? So maybe if you feel a little bit unconfident or if you're feeling like you don't have very much confidence in your writing skills, maybe go back and do a little bit of grammar review and make sure you feel really confident in how those grammar points are used to make sentences. So those would be maybe three places to start for working on your writing skills. And remember, like, like I said before, you were able to send me this message and communicate your points clearly, so you clearly already have some writing skills. So just have some confidence and try setting some goals for yourself, try copying some things out, and try a little bit of grammar review so that you can build more confidence in your writing skills too. So I hope that those three quick tips help you to work on your writing skills and good luck with improving that. Okay, thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Dushanta. Hi, Dushanta. Dushanta says, hey, Alicia, I have a question about the word being. I saw this sentence. Being disappointed sometimes is natural. What is the use of being in a sentence like this? Can you explain? Thanks. Mm, yeah, nice question. Being. So we use being to talk about a condition or a status. We have this ing form, right? This progressive or this continuous form. In your example sentence, being disappointed is natural. So we see after the word being is the word disappointed. Right? This is something that expresses emotion. This is an adjective. So I am disappointed. He is disappointed. Right? So it's very common to see this kind of pattern, being plus adjective, being plus some kind of status or condition adjective. So we use this expression, we use this being plus state or condition to talk about a temporary condition, to talk about a temporary status. Being disappointed or being happy, being sad, being angry, these refer to temporary conditions, temporary emotional conditions in this way. So this being has to be used in the ing form, like be disappointed is grammatically incorrect. For example, be disappointed is natural, this is incorrect. We are expressing a temporary condition, so we do that with the ing form of the verb be and our adjective. 
So being disappointed is natural. So we can use being in other sentence patterns as well to talk about conditions. So for example, kids sometimes use the expression, he's being annoying or you're being weird. So that means your temporary condition is annoying or your temporary condition is weird. So when we want to talk about a temporary condition or a temporary status that's related to our mental state, our emotions, or our behavior, we can use being before the adjective to do that. So in all of these examples, they follow that same pattern, being plus adjective being disappointed, he's being weird, you're being annoying, and so on. So keep in mind, this also expresses that the status is temporary. So I hope that this helps you understand this use of the word being. Now there are other uses of the word being, but I wanted to look at this one in particular because it can be a little bit confusing. But this is how we use it to talk about those temporary conditions. So I hope that this answers your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you as always for sending me your great questions. <laughs> Are you struggling to understand conversations in your target language? This video will improve your listening skills using practice dialogues. In this lesson, you'll listen to a dialogue with the text. Second, you'll review the key vocabulary followed by the English translations. And finally, you'll review the dialogue with the text again to master what you've learned. First, listen to the dialogue with the text on the screen. Okay, everybody, shift information has been posted for the month. It looks like we'll visit 25 cities in 30 days. Do we normally visit 25 different cities in one month? Yes, sometimes we visit even more. Where's our first stop? Charlotte. Hey, I have friends in Charlotte. It would be nice to see them. Now you will hear the key vocabulary, followed by the English translation. Shift. Scheduled time for a person to work. Shift. Shift. Posted. Affixed or placed on a wall, board, or website. Posted. Posted. Month. Any of the 12 divisions of the calendar year. Month. Month. Visit. To go to and stay at a place for a short period of time. Visit. Visit. 30. A cardinal number representing the third cycle of 10. 30. 30. Normally. In a normal or regular way. Normally. Normally. Different. Not alike. Dissimilar. Different. Different. Cities. Two or more large or important towns. Cities. Cities. Stop. An interruption in a journey. Stop. Stop. Finally. Let's review the dialogue again. See if you can understand more this time. Okay, everybody. Shift information has been posted for the month. It looks like we'll visit 25 cities in 30 days. Do we normally visit 25 different cities in one month? Yes. Sometimes we visit even more. Where's our first stop? Charlotte. Hey, I have friends in Charlotte. It would be nice to see them. This is the end of the lesson. In this lesson, you improved your listening and mastered key vocabulary for everyday life conversation. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about common omissions in pronunciation and in grammar. These are some common issues that I hear among learners, and they relate to pronunciation and to grammar. So we're going to compare a few different sentences in each group and understand how our pronunciation and our grammar makes changes to the actual meaning of the sentence. 
let's start on this side of the board. First, I want to compare this common issue uh, with present perfect and simple past grammar forms. So first I want to look at an expression like this, or rather I want to look at this pair. This is a very common issue that I hear. The student wants to say, I have lived. So when we say I have lived, we reduce the I have to I've, I've. For example, I've lived here for two years, or I've lived there before. The key here is this v sound, I've lived there, I've lived there. The issue that I hear a lot is learners drop this v sound and they say I, I lived there, I lived there. So the issue here is that I lived there is also grammatically correct. I've lived there and I lived there are both grammatically correct sentences, but they communicate different ideas. I've lived there means I have the experience of living in that place. So we're talking about general life experience. I lived there means I did, I had that experience and I do not live there now. This is a past tense expression. Oh yeah, I lived there, so I don't live there now. I've lived there before. So we're talking about general life experience here. We're talking about a simple past tense, something that's finished, something that's over. So this comes into play. So this is a, an important thing to consider when you're talking about uh, places where you live now. Like I've lived here for two years. So in that sentence, it's important to use this grammar. I've lived here for two years, which means I live here now. I want to talk about how long my stay has been. You cannot say, I lived here for two years, unless you're talking about a city where you used to live and that you are visiting now, because this is a simple past tense expression. So again, these are both grammatically correct, but they communicate different ideas. I lived here for two years would be said if you are visiting a city or your country maybe, you're visiting a place where you lived in the past and you do not live now. So these are two different ideas. We communicate this in the reduced form with this v sound, I've, I've. So maybe this is hard for you to pick up uh, when you listen, but make sure to make the sound as you practice. Take the time to practice making this sound. I have lived becomes I've, I've. And similarly, when your subject changes, we've and they've as well follow this same pattern. Let's look at one more pair. Same idea. She has reduces to she's, she's. So this she's, this does not mean she is. We know that because the verb that follows this is in the past participle form. So she is worked is grammatically incorrect. She has worked is grammatically correct. Past participle verb here. So this she's means she has worked, she has worked. In contrast, on the other hand, however, she with no s creates a simple past tense structure. She worked. So this is the beginning to a simple past tense expression. So to create another example, she's worked here for two years. She's worked here for two years means starting two years ago until this conversation, she continued, she has nonstop worked at this place. That's what we communicate with this she's, she's. This sentence, however, she worked here for two years, means she does not work here anymore. She worked here for two years. Ah, then she got a new job, or then she moved to a new city. She worked here with no S sound, communicates that simple past tense. That means the situation is finished, it's over. So she's worked, she's worked here for two and a half years. She worked here for two and a half years. Present perfect, simple past tense. So don't forget this S sound. The same rule applies when your subject is he or it. He's worked here or it's been there and so on. So we need to pronounce that S sound uh, and we need to make sure to use the correct form of the verb too. So in these cases, uh, nice a nice example where the past uh, simple past tense and the past participle form are the same um, but there are some cases of course where they are different too 
So another thing to keep in mind, but please make sure to use this s sound when your subject is she, he, or it, and use this v sound when your subject is I, or you, or we, or they, for your present perfect statements. Okay, let's go to pair number two for this lesson. Another common omission or change problem that I hear is this one, making present tense statement or making a request with would. So sometimes I hear students want, they want to make a polite request. And when we make a polite request, we can use would to do that. For example, I would something something. Like I would like water. So I want to drink water, but a polite request is I would like water. I would like water. When we make the reduced form of I would, we make this I'd, I'd. So I becomes I'd, I would, or rather I would becomes I'd. I'd like water. This right here is the thing that many students forget to say and forget to write. I'd like water, I'd like water. If we forget this, if we do not include this, if we omit this d sound, it becomes this, I, I like water. This is a simple present tense statement. I'm just sharing a fact about myself. I like water. Okay, great, <laughs> I like water. This is not a request, I like water. This is a request, I'd like water. I'd like water, please. I like water, totally different. So we need to include this d sound. I'd like water, I'd like water, please. So please be careful to include this d sound. Let's look at one more example, this time with subject we, we. So this we d is the reduced form of we would. We would becomes we'd, we'd, we'd. We'd like steak, we'd like steak. So this is a polite request for steak. We'd like steak. Again, if we do not pronounce this D sound, or if we do not write this D sound, it becomes this. We like steak, a simple fact about yourself. We like steak. Okay, great, congratulations, you like steak. So this D sound in speaking and this D in writing communicates a request. We'd like steak. So I've put these here. These are very commonly used at restaurants and bars and places where you make orders. So when you make polite requests with would, please make sure to use this d sound when you make the request, uh, just to make sure your communication is accurate. Okay, let's look at one more example. This one, this group really, covers future tense and present tense issues. So. There are a couple of future tense forms. We can use will and we can use going to, to make future tense expressions. But I often hear learners forget to include things. So let's look at this first group. I'll, I'm, and I. So I'll is the reduced form of I will, I will. We use will when we're talking about making decisions in the conversation. There's a video about this going to versus will, the simple future tense uh, video on the channel. Please check that out. So I will, for example, uh, reduces to I'll. We can use it in I'll go to work. I'll go to work. So the issue here is often I hear students forget to use I'll and they say I, I. So I'll cover this in just a moment. Let's compare this to I'm. I'm, which is the reduced form of I am. I am becomes I'm, I'm. I'm going to work, I'm going to work. So again, I often hear students drop the m sound there, becomes I going to work, which is totally incorrect, grammatically incorrect. Finally, I, so no am, no will, I. I go to work. I go to work. So I go to work is just a simple present tense statement. For example, I go to work every day, or I go to work on Mondays. So I'm sharing a simple fact about myself. I go to work, okay, great. I'll, however, I'll go to work. I'll go to work. I'm making a decision about my future right now. Okay, I'll go to work. If I forget the o sound, I'll, if I forget to include that, it becomes this. I go to work. 
I'm just making a simple present tense statement. I'm not sharing any future plan at all. Same thing here. I'm going to work. We have to use m there. I going to work is grammatically incorrect. Uh, so you cannot use I going to work. We cannot make that. That's totally an incorrect sentence. I'm going to work. So these points are common points of omission. Let's look at one more example. Let's change our subject. He, he in this case. He'll is the reduced form of he will. He will. He will becomes he'll. He'll. He'll come later. He'll come later. So again, this part right here, learners forget to say. He come later. Not correct. We cannot use this. Similarly, he's, he's. So because my subject is he, I cannot use am like I did here. When the subject is he, she, or it, we change our be verb to is, is. So he is, he is. He is reduces to he's, he's, he's. So he's, for example, he's coming later. He's coming later. So oftentimes students forget this S sound. He coming later is totally grammatically incorrect and we cannot use this. He's coming later, he's coming later. Finally, if you don't have any sound here, you have he, you might get a sentence like this. He comes later. For example, he comes later than his boss. So this is a simple present tense expression that's just sharing a fact about the situation. Oh, that guy, yeah, he comes later to the office than his boss. He comes later is just sharing a regular situation, general information. These two, which like we want to use simple future tense to communicate an idea, they need to include this heel or this he's to communicate that future tense. If you don't have this, the sentences are grammatically incorrect. So these are your key points for future tense expressions. So please don't forget these m and o and z sounds here. And on this side, don't forget with present perfect expressions, these v and s sounds. And here in the middle too, don't forget these d sounds as well. So I hope that this is helpful for you. These are very, very common issues. Uh, I've called them omissions because there's not really always a mistake, but it does share, it does often communicate the wrong idea if you don't use the correct grammar. So please try to be careful about these in your writing and in your speaking. Of course, if you know about any other issues, any other omissions, things we often forget, please feel free to share those in the comment section. Also, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making some example sentences with these points, please feel free to put those in the comments on this video as well. Also, please don't forget, if you like this lesson, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you have not already. Also, please check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about restaurant service questions and answers. These are expressions you can use if you are a staff member at a restaurant, uh, or of course you can use the answers to these questions if you are a guest at a restaurant. So let's get started. All right, for this lesson, I'm going to go through the flow, the basic flow of visiting a restaurant. So the first question for staff is usually how many people or how many people in your party? So party is a word that we use to mean group. We use party in dining situations. So party doesn't mean like, you know, a big, like a party in like a, a bar or a club or something. Party here means group. So how many people in your group or in your party? You may hear that. To respond, just say, Three, five, one, two, whatever the number is. Just reply with the number of people who are going to join you or the number of people in your group at that moment. You can say, for example, two, but one more person is going to join us later or five people total. Uh, maybe some people are late. You can say that specifically if you need to as well. Okay, so after that, the next question in many cases 
is the staff will ask you smoking or non, or smoking or non-smoking. So sometimes you might hear smoking removed from this and this the staff might say smoking or non uh, because we understand it means non-smoking. So to answer it, just say smoking or no smoking or non-smoking. So this question is about where you want to sit. So some restaurants have smoking and non-smoking seats. That means it's okay to smoke in a smoking seat. It's not okay to smoke in a non-smoking seat. So if you have a preference, you can say smoking please or non-smoking please or no smoking. Either of these will communicate the idea. Okay, the next one. Are you ready to order? Are you ready to order? At native speed, this question sounds like, are you ready to order? Are you ready to order? So this is nice for servers to use because you don't just walk to the table and say, okay, I'm ready, like I'm here. You ask the guests, are you ready? Are you ready to order? So it's like you're confirming, is it okay if I come to you now? Or what is, is, is everything all right? So you can answer this with yes, I'll have. So this I'll have, this is the beginning to an order. Yes, I'll have an appetizer, or yes, I'll have this pasta, whatever your order is. If you are not ready, you still need some time to look at the menu, you can say, could we have a little more time? Here I've used we, could I have a little more time is also okay. So we, if you're in a pair or in a group of people, could we have a little more time? At native speed, this sounds like, could we have a little more time, please? Could we have a little more time? So are you ready to order? Yes, or ask for more time here. Usually if you say no, it's too direct. So instead just say, could we have a little more time? Alternatively, another thing is you can use this question uh, to ask a question about the menu too. We'll talk about this here. So you might also have a server who asks you this question, which is, do you have any questions about the menu? Do you have any questions about the menu? For restaurant staff, a point to note here is this S. Make sure to use the plural questions. So do you have any question is incorrect. Do you have any questions about the menu? And so please use the Please use about here. Do you have any questions about the menu? So if you have a question, this is a yes or no question. Do you, do you have? So this is a yes or no question. If you have a question, yes, what's this item? Or yes, is this item gluten-free? Or is this item vegetarian? And so on. So yes, and then you ask your question. Or no, I'm okay. No, I'm okay. So you can um, use these to respond here. Like, are you ready to order? You could say, actually, I have a question. What's this thing? Or is this gluten-free? So you can connect these a little bit if you like, if you need to. Okay, the next one. This one depends on the restaurant a little bit. Sometimes you will go to a restaurant or cafe or bar as well, and that day there's special menu items. There's some like uh, maybe one day only dish. The server will often explain that with this expression. Today's specials are Today's specials are. So in this case, I'm using are because usually there's some, like a few different special dishes or a few different special drinks. Uh, sometimes maybe you find a restaurant where there's just one thing. In that case, change are to is and change specials, plural, to special one, singular. So today's special is this pasta, or today's specials are this pasta, this fish, and this meat. So use the plural form or the singular form, depending on if you have one special or many specials, more than two, uh, or rather more than one. Um, and also please note today's, today's, not today, today's specials. So today's, that means this item belongs to today. So these are the special items for today. As a guest to respond to this, just say, okay, or thank you, 
Or you can ask a question like, "Oh, what's the sauce on the pasta?" or "What kind of fish is it?" Something like that. If you want to ask a follow-up question、uh, about specials, it's very natural to do that. Okay, moving on to the next question: What can I get you? What can I get you? This is a very common and very friendly-sounding question from the staff at a restaurant to a guest. At native speed, this sounds like, "What can I get you? What can I get you?" Or you might hear, "What can I get you?" What can I get you? What can I get you? So this sounds very friendly, and usually it shows that、uh, the staff is ready to take your order. They're waiting there to write your order. So what can I get you? To respond to this, I'll have. I'll have. So this I'll have means I will have some menu item. So I'll have a salad, or I'll have、uh, this steak. So I'll have plus your menu item. Alternatively, another way to say it, I'd like. I'd like. Again, a key pronunciation point. I'd is I would in the reduced form. I would like something something. You can follow it in exactly the same way, or rather, follow this expression、uh, with another dish name. So, like, I'd like the steak. I'd like a salad, please. So,、uh, just place your order. Give your order when you hear this question. You might also hear a server ask, "What would you like to drink? What would you like to drink?" So this is a question about a drink order. You can say, "Just water, just water." So depending on the restaurant, some restaurants charge money for water. Water costs money. In many restaurants, water is free. So you can say, "Just water, just water."、Uh, if you want to order a drink, say "a" plus the drink name. Please, so a soda, please, or a Pepsi, please. Of course, if your drink begins with a vowel sound, use an, like an orange juice, please, for example. So just use、uh, the indefinite article a or an plus your drink name, and I like to end it with please. It sounds more polite. It sounds a little nicer. You might also hear this question. This is another yes or no question. Would you like anything to drink? At native speed, would you like anything to drink? So, would you like anything to drink? Is a yes or no? Just a quick yes. A drink, please. So, like yes, an orange juice, please, or yes, a beer, please. You can use just water, or if you don't want anything, just use no, thank you, no, thank you. So you don't need any drink. So you might hear one of these two. What would you like to drink? Is an information question. Would you like anything to drink? Is a yes or no question. So just small differences in how to answer these two. Okay, the next couple questions. These are used during the meal. So in restaurants in the USA and in some other countries as well, it's common and it's expected that the restaurant staff will visit the guest's table during the meal. Like the guest didn't call the staff. But the staff will visit to check with the guests, and they will usually ask a question like this: "How is everything? How is everything?" So this means, "How is your meal?" It means, "Is your food okay? Is your like, is your drink okay? Is everything ready?" It's like, "Do you need anything?" So the, this is kind of a question, like an it's it's an opportunity. For the guests to ask for something, so you can reply to this with "Great, thanks." This means we're fine. We don't need anything. How is everything? It's great, thank you. So that means I don't need you. I don't need anything. Thank you for checking on me. Or, if you need something, you can say, "Could I have this thing, please?" So this could be anything you need at the restaurant within reason. So. Could I have a napkin, please? Or could I have a new spoon, please? I dropped mine on the floor. So could I have item, please? Of course, if you have a problem with your meal, you can say it here. You can mention it here. Like, how is everything? You might say, 
uh, I didn't order this, or I don't think this is what I ordered. So if you have some kind of problem as well, if there's some kind of issue, or if you have a question about your meal, you can ask it uh, if the staff asks you this question. You may also hear, can I get you anything else? Can I get you anything else? At native speed, this sounds like, can I get you anything else? So again, the staff will come to your table and ask this question, which means, would you like to order something? Would you like another item from the menu? Can I get you anything else? So this else here means other than, so you, other than the things that you have on the table. Can I get you something more, in other words? Can I get you anything else? To respond, no, I'm fine. Thanks. No, I'm fine. Thanks. Or no, we're fine. Thanks. So no more orders. We're finished. Or to order, could I have item, please? Or could I have this dessert, please? Or could I have this drink, please? So you can order here. This is another opportunity to order something. So these are fairly common, actually very common questions uh, that staff use to check with guests. How's everything? Do you are like uh, another question is, are you enjoying your meal? Something like that. Just respond with yes or no, or ask a question. Use that opportunity to ask a question. So it's considered a good service for staff to come to the diner's table, to come to the guest table, to check on them regularly. It shows they're paying attention, and um, they're paying attention to the needs of their customers. So this is considered a good thing. Finally, when your meal is finished, the staff will typically bring your check or your bill. We use both words in the US. They will typically bring the check or the bill to the table, though you may pay at the table. So you may give cash or a card or something at the table, or they may tell you where to go to pay for your meal. Usually they'll say, here's your check, here's your check, or here's your bill. Another point uh, for restaurant staff, here's, here's. So this is here is, here is. Here's your check or here's your bill. Here's your check, here's your bill. Please pay here at the table. Please pay here at the table or please pay at the register. Please pay at the register. Or maybe you might hear please pay at the front or maybe please pay in the lobby, depending on what kind of restaurant or maybe hotel uh, you're at. So it'll often be something like this. Here's your check, please pay here at the table. Or I'll take your check or I'll take your bill whenever you're ready. So here at the table, something like that uh, will tell you, you don't have to go anywhere. Or when the server says, I'll take uh, your check when you're ready, that means just give it to the server. You don't need to go anywhere. So to reply to this, okay, thank you. <laughs> That's all you need to do. And of course, pay. So uh, this is a very typical flow of visiting a restaurant or visiting a bar in a typical, I would say, restaurant, yeah, restaurant, bar, cafe situation in the US. So I hope that this was helpful for you, whether you are restaurant staff or a regular diner. So if you have any questions or comments, or if you know some other restaurant-related questions or answers, please feel free to leave those in the comment section of this video. Also, if you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about 10 vocabulary words for technology. I've chosen these vocabulary words because at the time of recording this video, these are words that are kind of related to modern technology. So very, very modern or the newest technology. Maybe a few years from now, this will have changed, but I hope that this is useful for you. Let's get started. Okay. The first word I want to look at is wireless, wireless. Wireless is used before a noun to mean something that does not have a wire. There's no cord, there's nothing attached. So for example, like my microphone has a wire. There's a cord connecting my microphone to my mic pack. So this is a wired mic, a wired mic. 
but we have many wireless technologies now. For example, we have wireless networks, wireless networks. We commonly call these Wi-Fi in our homes and in restaurants and cafes. So a Wi-Fi, uh, or rather Wi-Fi, refers to a wireless internet connection. We have wireless chargers for our smartphones now, so we don't need to use a cord to plug in our smartphone to something. We can charge it on top of some kind of charging device. We also have wireless headphones too, so we can put in headphones with no cord. We use the Bluetooth technology or something similar to do that. So wireless means anything that does not have a cord, does not have a wire. We call that wireless. Okay, the next two are, seem very similar but are very different. The first one is VR. VR means virtual reality, virtual reality. So this is pronounced virtual, virtual. At native speed, this sounds like virtual reality. So these R and L sounds kind of connect, virtual reality. So virtual reality means something that is completely digital. Virtual means something that's like inside a computer or it, it's an environment, a type of space that's 100% created by a computer. So it is a virtual version, a computer version of real life. Reality refers to the real world, the real, like our real life environment. So virtual reality is a computer world, essentially. So we have virtual reality games, for example. We can put on a mask or we can put on goggles or glasses and we can play a game inside a computer world where it feels like we are inside that environment. That's called a virtual reality game. We also have virtual reality experiences. So you can go to um, like a couple of maybe uh, different genres of virtual reality experience. You can of course do games, but you can do uh, like travel experiences with virtual reality, or you can do virtual reality home tours, I think too. So that means again, you put on uh, glasses or goggles or something, and you can go inside a home in a virtual home. It's not real, but you can uh, walk around and have the feeling of experiencing a vacation place or experiencing a home or something similar. So we call that a virtual reality experience, a virtual reality experience. These points, these are different from AR. So AR refers to augmented reality, augmented reality. So augmented, uh, the root here is augment, augment. So to augment, that's a verb. To augment something means to add something on, like you're adding something new to something else, to augment something. Here, augmented reality means we are adding something to the real world. So virtual reality means the real world is actually digital. So it's, it's not really uh, the real world. It appears like the real world, but it's digital. Augmented reality is the real world plus something. So this is a big difference between these two. Real world plus something. So augmented reality is quite long. We often say AR instead, AR. We use AR in expressions like this, an AR effect, an AR effect. So an augmented reality effect. So for example, if you take a picture on your phone and you want to add some special effects to your picture, you can do that with AR. So maybe it looks like there's uh, bright, like writing with fire or something in your picture, or you see um, some kind of like special imagery, or you want to include some other kind of interesting effect, whatever you like. That's an AR effect. You're adding something that's not there. You're adding something to that reality. You may also hear about AR apps, AR apps. This is at the time of recording this video. This is in kind of a new or emerging, an emerging technology means it's coming out now. It's becoming available now. Uh, an AR app is something that we use on our phone, our smartphone, that changes reality like as we look at the phone. So a great example of this is like a map function. So when we check a map on our phones, we can see the map clearly 
with an AR map app, an AR map app, we might look at the phone and ask for directions and the directions appear on our phone through our camera and we see lines on our camera telling us where to go. So it adds something to the world around us. To my understanding, AR apps can also be used with technology like Google Glass, for example. You can see a guideline, like again, to use the map example, you can see a guideline uh, telling you which direction to go on your glasses or in your glasses, I suppose. Uh, so you can actually change the way you see the real world by using one of these apps. Pretty interesting. So this is called AR or augmented reality, adding something to reality. Okay. The next word is reception, reception. So reception, uh, of course we can use reception at like a hotel or maybe at like a restaurant lobby or a restaurant uh, desk or something. But reception here uh, refers to the signal that you get, usually with a mobile phone or a cell phone or something. Um, and you can also use it to talk about a like wireless network signal too. So we often use this in the negative form, like, ah, I don't have any reception here. That means my phone has no signal. I get no signal. So we use reception with the type of network often. So 5G is emerging, 5G is coming out uh, maybe very soon at the time of recording this video, but you might have 3G reception or 4G reception, someday 5G reception. These are the different levels of networks. So uh, you might hear reception talked about together with these kinds of things. So reception means the signal. So you have good reception, means the signal is good, or you have bad reception, which means there's not a very good signal, not a good connection. So reception is commonly used to talk about uh, the ability to transfer information, to connect to a network somewhere. Okay, the next word I want to talk about is haptic, haptic. This, at the time of recording, is a, is a new and emerging technology. We're seeing this haptic technology come out on the iPhone 11. Uh, so haptic is anything relating to touch. Haptic refers to the sensation of touching something. So when we talk about haptic technology, it means some kind of technology that creates a sensation of touch. So that means we're not actually touching that object, we're not actually touching something or feeling that thing, but the device creates some sensation and we feel like, oh, we're actually touching something or we feel some kind of motion. That's called haptic technology. So anything haptic relates to the sense of touch, the, the sense of feeling something. So for example, you might see haptic devices, haptic devices. This means any device, so some kind of machine or a gadget or some kind of technology that uses haptic technology. So something that has this touch-related technology. You might also uh, hear about like haptic game controllers. So a game controller that gives the user some feeling of touch or of like some kind of sensation. So maybe that's through vibrations or through maybe some kind of shaking or something or even more detailed uh, haptic technology. So you might hear haptic devices or haptic game controllers and so on, quite interesting. Okay, let's go to the next vocabulary word. The next word is IOT. IOT refers to the Internet of Things, the Internet of Things. Usually we use this word just as, just as a simple noun phrase alone, as in like the Internet of Things is an interesting topic or the, interest, uh, the Internet of Things is a topic of a lot of study now. So Internet of Things means, uh, or it's, at least at the time of recording this video, is kind of a conceptual idea where many objects are connected through an internet. So right now, of course, we have many objects which are not connected through an internet, but the internet of things has this, there's this idea that one day perhaps our maybe important devices or our important things could all be connected. So for example, 
like in your home, maybe your refrigerator and the lights in your home, the microwave, your toaster, your rice cooker, uh, maybe your bathtub, and I don't know, maybe even like your alarm clock. All of these objects that you use every day could be connected somehow and you could access them through your smartphone. So this is the idea with the internet of things. So things here means actually objects in your everyday life and they connect to an internet. So it's like making a network of objects essentially and then we can control all of those things with a smartphone or with a computer or something. This is the concept of the internet of things. Okay, onward to the next one. Next is AI. AI. AI means artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Artificial means not real and intelligence means like something, the level of something's like uh, smartness essentially. So uh, artificial intelligence usually refers to robots and machines doing things instead of humans. So for example, AI powered chatbot. So you'll often see AI used with powered or like AI based or AI enabled. So powered here means this noun, in this case a chat bot. So if you've been to a, a website that has an automatic chat function, that's probably an AI powered chat bot. So artificial intelligence powered chat bot means a robot is chatting with you on that website. We say AI powered chat bot to describe that. In this case, AI enabled apps, that means inside the app you can use, so enabled, enabled means able to use, and artificial intelligence. So again, that means inside the app you are able to use some kind of like robot uh, intelligence or some kind of machine intelligence inside an app. So you'll hear AI powered or AI enabled uh, to talk about these machine or robot based technologies a lot. Okay. On to the next one, which is HD. HD, if you are a YouTube user, you probably already know HD. HD means high definition. We use HD a lot in media to talk about the resolution. So that means how clear the video is. So uh, an HD, a high definition video, is generally a good thing. You can buy HD TVs, HD televisions, to watch HD video. So an HD TV means a TV that you can play high definition videos on and it will display the video correctly. HD video means a video that was prepared in HD, in high definition. So high definition means there's a large degree, a large amount of clarity. So definition means the details. So high definition, lots and lots of details is another way to understand high definition. Okay, the next one, driverless cars, driverless cars. You'll notice driverless shares this suffix less with wireless, wireless. So this less means not, or not having something, or no, or none. So wireless means no wire. Driverless means no driver. So a driverless car, driverless cars. This is another new emerging technology at the time of making this video. So in sentences, you might see something like this. We might have driverless cars in the future or driverless cars could be dangerous. So we use driverless cars exactly the same way as we use the word cars. We're just adding this word to make it specific. What type of car? Driverless car. So we can use it in exactly the same way we use the word car. We're just making a, a specific statement about this type. Okay, finally, the last vocabulary, the last vocabulary point is machine learning, machine learning. So machine learning is perhaps as it sounds, it's learning, so a, a robot or some other kind of computer system learns things like very, very quickly from user input. So a great example of this is the second example, search engines use machine learning. Search engines use machine learning. So this means when you use Google or whatever other search engine, when you type in information into the search box or when you search for something in Google, 
a machine or a system, a robot, a computer, tracks your information, like your search information, and over time with many, many, many people all around the world searching for things, the system, this machine, learns how to be more efficient. It learns how to give the best results. So machine learning is used to give efficient or good results for a specific goal. So there are many, many different ways that we use machine learning. Search engines are one way of doing that. So another example, our software uses machine learning. So you can use this to achieve a specific goal. Maybe you need to do data analysis or something like that. Uh, perhaps you have a machine learning way to do that. So machine learning is coming up more and more as we have lots and lots of data uh, from all around the world. Uh, a lot of places and a lot of companies take that data and through machine learning uh, can get some interesting results. So machine learning is in the news a lot uh, these days with relationship to tech and software and so on. Okay, so those are 10 vocabulary words relating to modern technology at the time of this video. Perhaps it has changed. Uh, so if there's some other stuff, there probably is, uh, please let us know about it in the comment section of this video. Also, uh, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making some sentences with these vocabulary words, please feel free to do that in the comment section as well. Also, if you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about simple present tense in English. Let's get started. Okay, I want to begin this lesson by looking at when to use the simple present tense. There are two points I want to focus on. Number one, we use simple present tense to share facts. So facts refers to information that is always true. For example, I speak English. In this sentence, speak is simple present tense. In this example, he works in New York City. This is a fact, just information that is true. Works is a simple present tense verb. In one more example, they don't live in France. Don't live is simple present tense but it's just a negative. They don't live in France. So these are examples of simple facts. We express facts with simple present tense. The second use of simple present tense is to express regular actions. So especially this is for items in a schedule or a timetable. When I say schedule or timetable, I mean, for example, something that happens every day at the same time or every week or every month or every year. So it's something that we understand happens regularly. So, for example, I visit my parents every month. In this sentence, visit is a simple present tense verb. And we know that this is a regular action because we have this expression in the sentence, every month. In the next example, the bus leaves at 3 p.m. Leaves is in simple present tense. This is part of a timetable at 3 p.m. So we can understand this is part of a bus schedule. Finally, he doesn't call me every day. He doesn't call me every day. Here, again, we have a negative expression. He doesn't call is in simple present tense. It's a negative expression. And here we have every day. So this shows an action that does not happen every day. So these are the two ways to use or the two times to use simple present tense. Next, I want to talk about how to make simple present tense. First, let's look at how to make statements. Statements. I've broken this into positive and negative statements. First, let's take a look at how to make positive statements. We need to think about the subject of the sentence. When we're making basic statements, there are two ways to approach it. If your subject is I, 
you, we, or they, we use this pattern. So I, you, we, or they, plus our infinitive verb. So infinitive verb means just the basic form of the verb. There's no change to the verb, like eat or sleep or drink, just the basic verb form. Then we can add extra information. So the most basic type of sentence is just a subject and a verb. But in many cases, we want to add some more information. We do this after the verb. If, however, your subject is he, she, or it, we use first the subject, then the infinitive verb, and then we add an S sound to the verb. So in most cases, we just change this to add simply an S. So infinitive verb plus just an S. In some cases, we add ES, and in some cases, we add IES. Here is the rule for understanding which type of S ending to use. We add ES, this ES, for verbs ending in double S, so SS, for verbs ending in O, SH, CH, TCH, X, and Z. So if the infinitive verb ends in one of these, we need to add ES when our subject is he, she, or it in a simple present tense statement. If your subject is I, you, we, or they, there's no change to the verb. So this is kind of a tricky point to keep in mind. This will get easier with practice to remember. Then about this point, this IES ending. For verbs ending in a consonant, so consonant means the letters other, the letters that are not A, E, I, O, and U, and sometimes Y. But for verbs ending in consonant plus Y, we remove the Y and we add I, E, S. So I'll show you an example of this in just a moment. So this is how we make positive statements with simple present tense. Let's like kind of compare this then to making negative statements, negative statements. When you want to make a negative statement, again, there are two kind of patterns to follow. Again, the subject is very important here. So if your subject is I, you, we, or they, we include don't before the infinitive verb. So yes, you can also use do not. But in everyday speech, we use this reduced don't, typically. So do not sounds a little more stiff, a little bit more formal. We typically use don't in everyday speech. So I don't, or you don't, we don't, they don't, plus infinitive verb. So again, no change to the verb. And then uh, in some cases, we add some extra information at the end of the sentence. The other pattern is the he, she, or it subject pattern. If the subject is he, she, or it, we use doesn't, doesn't. So doesn't is the reduced form of does not. So he doesn't, she doesn't, it doesn't, plus infinitive verb, no change here. So when we make a positive statement, we need to add an S sound to the end of the infinitive verb. When we're making a negative statement, we do not need to make any changes to the verb. Just a plain infinitive verb is perfect, it's fine. And then we can add our extra information after the verb. So, with this information in mind, let's practice making a few sentences with these examples. So, our first situation, our first example, they something something every day. If I want to use the verb cook, in this expression, what should I do? First, I need to look at the subject of the sentence, they. I'm using they in this pattern. This is a positive, I know, because there's no not here. So, I follow this pattern. My pattern when they is the subject is just infinitive verb plus extra information. So, I know this should be cook. They cook every day. This is the correct sentence. The next example, she something something reports every month. My verb here is write, write. So I look at my subject, my subject is she, 
I know from my hint, this is a positive sentence, so there's no not here. So I can go here. So she is my subject. Infinitive verb plus an S sound. I know that. So which S ending should I use? My verb here is write. It doesn't end in any of these spellings. And it doesn't end in consonant plus Y. So I know I should use just a simple S ending. She writes reports every month is the correct sentence. She writes reports every month. All right, on to the next example. He, something, something, a car. So here, my clue is not have, not have. So my clue, my hint here, tells me this should be a negative statement. So I'll start my search here in the negative section. I see my sentence, my subject is he. So I know I should use this pattern. He plus doesn't plus infinitive verb. So again, no change to the verb in a negative statement. That means I can use doesn't plus have to make a negative. So the final sentence becomes, he doesn't have a car. He doesn't have a car. All right, one more example. She, something, internationally four times a year. Internationally. So internationally means outside her country or outside uh, the place where she lives. So my verb here is fly. I see that this is probably a positive statement because there's no not here. So fly, and my subject is she, okay. So she plus infinitive verb. Now which S pattern should I use? My verb is fly, and it follows this pattern. So it's a verb that ends in consonant plus Y. So L is a consonant. Consonant plus Y ending. The rule is to remove Y and add I-E-S. So the correct answer is flies. She flies internationally four times a year. So this is how we can find the correct verb form to use depending on the sentence. So your subject is very important here. Okay. With that, let's continue to making questions. This is about how to make statements with simple present tense. Let's practice how to make questions with simple present tense. Again, the subject of our sentence is very important. Let's take a look at these two to begin. These are our yes and no type questions. So when I say yes or no type question, I mean the questions we can answer by saying just yes or no. So, to make yes or no questions uh, in simple present tense, we can use this pattern if our subject is I, you, we, or they, again. Uh, do I, do you, do we, do they, plus our infinitive verb, plus our extra information. I included here do I. This is kind of a rare pattern, this do I, because usually we don't ask ourselves like yes or no questions. But sometimes, if you're the kind of person who talks to yourself sometimes, as many of us are, uh, you might think to yourself a do I question. Like, do I have a meeting today? Like, you think out loud. You're thinking to yourself. You might say it out loud. So this is kind of a rare pattern, do I, but you might use it when you talk to yourself. So when we make a uh, an yes or no question, this is the pattern for I, you, we, and they subjects. If, however, your subject is he, she, or it, we use does to begin the question. Does he, does she, does it, plus infinitive verb, plus extra information. So again, notice when you're making a question, you do not need to make a change to the infinitive verb. There's no S here. There's no S sound that's added when you're making a question. We just need to figure uh, to change the do or does to match the subject of our question. So let's compare this to a WH question. So when I say WH question, I mean who, what, where, when, why, those questions. So when we're asking these like information questions, we want to get some information more than just yes or no. These are the patterns we use. Again, uh, subject is important here. So 
we use WH question, like who, what, where, plus do, plus your subject, I, you, we, they, plus our infinitive verb and our extra information. If, however, again, our subject is he, she, or it, we use WH question, who, what, where, does, he, infinitive verb, extra information. So, let's practice these two types of question in these examples. Let's begin here. There are two blanks, you'll notice. So, something, you, something, here. Mm. My verb here is work. So, I know that I need to put something in this one space. And there's since there's only one space, I can guess it's probably this pattern. So, this pattern, the information question pattern, requires two words before the subject. So this one, I can guess, follows this pattern. My subject is you, so I know this part should be do, do you. And my verb here is work, so do you work here. My infinitive verb does not take any changes in this pattern. Do you work here? So you might need to use this if you're shopping and you find someone, you have a question. Do you work here? Can I ask you a question? Okay, on to the next one. Something, he, something in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood. So my verb is live, live. Again, one space here. My subject is he, so I go to this pattern and I have one word before my he subject. So I understand this is does, does he. My verb is live. In this pattern, there's no change to the infinitive verb. Does he live in your neighborhood? It's perfect. Does he live in your neighborhood? Okay, on to the next pair. These two are going to use this WH question pattern. So, what something, we something for the party? My verb is need, need. So I've added this to make it a little easier, easier to understand. What something, we? So here I have we, where should I look? for the pattern that uses we. And before we is do. What do we? My infinitive verb takes no change, so what do we need for the party is the correct question. What do we need for the party at native speed? One more, when something, he, something to the office. So here, my verb is go, go. Again, my subject here is he, so I need to look at this pattern. Before he is does, in between my question word and my subject. So, when does he, my verb go, takes no change in this pattern. When does he go to the office? When does he go to the office at native speed? Okay, I want to end this lesson with a couple of kind of extra examples. I've used these why patterns. So you might know about this kind of advice pattern, which is using a why question to make a gentle suggestion. And this takes kind of an interesting pattern. Uh, we make this in kind of a special way. So it's why something, you something, your computer in this case. My verb is restart, to restart a computer. When we make these advice patterns though, we use a negative here. So we follow the same rule, like this, but in this portion, the do or does portion, we follow this rule right here. We use the same negative words, don't uh, and doesn't. This makes a kind of gentle, soft advice or suggestion pattern. So in this case, you is my subject. We learned over here, uh, when you is the subject, the negative is don't. So we place it here. We'll make the negative don't here. Why don't you, no change to the verb. Why don't you restart your computer? So this is a suggestion. I'm having computer trouble. Oh no, I don't know what to do. Why don't you restart your computer? Is something your coworker or your friend might say. Another example of this, why something, she something, her schedule. And my verb is change, change. So she is my subject. 
In the positive, it's does. We learned here the negative form is doesn't. Doesn't. So, why doesn't she, no change, why doesn't she change her schedule? Why doesn't she change her schedule? She seems so busy. So, these are the different ways we can make questions and advice, uh, giving suggestions with simple present tense. So, this is an introduction to when to use, how to make, and a couple of extra points about simple present tense. I hope that this lesson was helpful for you. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making sentences or questions with simple present tense, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Also, if you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about college or university vocabulary words. Let's get started. All right, first, let's talk about the difference between college and university. Most people use them interchangeably, but specifically, the difference is this. A college offers four-year courses, so that means four years of education, four years of study, and you can earn a degree. So I'm going to talk about degrees a bit later in this lesson. So a college offers four years, four years of education, four years of study to get a degree. For example, I got into a good college. I got into a good college. So got in means I was accepted to. I was accepted to a college as a student. I got into a good college. A university then, a university offers four-year courses, like a college, yes, and universities have what's called a graduate school. So there are these four-year courses, and then graduate school is like extra study after the four-year coursework. So for example, the university is well known for its space program. Okay. So university, college, then the next point, graduate school, which I've mentioned here uh, in this kind of explanation of university. So a graduate school, a graduate school is education or a graduate school offers education after four-year coursework. So after college uh, or after uh, the basic like general education required to get a bachelor's degree, which I'll talk about later, you can choose to go to graduate school. So if you choose to go to graduate school, you get higher level degrees, a master's degree or a PhD. Again, I'll talk about those later. So graduate school is like even more study. For example, are you going to go to graduate school? Okay. The next word is TA, TA. A TA is a teaching assistant, a teaching assistant. So this is someone who is an assistant to your instructor. So in most cases, in colleges and universities, there's one instructor. This could be a professor, it could be an associate professor, uh, it could be like a visiting guest lecturer. There are many different types of instructor and the definitions uh, can change depending on the college or the university. But in general, there's one instructor and the instructor may have a teaching assistant or there may be more than one teaching assistant. These teaching assistants help the instructor with the class. So this might mean the teaching assist assistant leads uh, group discussions, or the teaching assistant helps with homework, or the teaching assistant helps students uh, to learn some topics in more detail. So teaching assistants are often graduate students. So a graduate student is a student in the graduate school. So it's very common for a graduate school student to work together with a professor in the graduate school in the same topic and the graduate student gets some extra credit or has maybe a part-time job as a teaching assistant for the professor. So they have the same subject, they have the same topic of study and the teaching assistant uh, works together with the professor in this way. So for example, in a sentence, he got the reading assignment 
from the TA. He got the reading assignment from the TA. So this might mean my classmate received our week's reading assignment from the TA, from the teaching assistant. So TA is a very common way to abbreviate, to shorten teaching assistant. Okay, on to the next expression or the next vocabulary word, which is syllabus, syllabus. Syllabus refers to a course schedule and overview. In most colleges and universities, you get this document, this physical document, on the first day of class. It's very common for the first day of a course to be like an orientation day. So that means you learn all of the important days, you learn all of the materials you need to gather for the lesson, you learn everything you need to know about the class. So a syllabus is very important because it teaches you when all of your exams are going to happen. It teaches you, or explains rather, it explains all of the other important dates, like the dates for assignments, uh, deadlines for assignments. It will give you the assigned readings. Usually there are some things to read for your lessons. And it'll also give you contact information for your professor, for your TA, and so on. You'll typically find information information about the grading scale for your class too. Uh, other information you might see in a syllabus includes something about like the course topics in general, like the aim of the course and what you can expect to learn in the course. Uh, you'll also find contact information for the key people in your course and maybe any assistance in the course too. So the syllabus is a very important document. It has like all your textbooks as well. So. This is a very common expression, this example sentence. Check the syllabus before you email the professor. This is something most instructors say very often in college courses or university courses. If you have a question, the first document you should check is your syllabus. Does your syllabus answer this question that you have? So make sure you check your syllabus before you email your professor or your teaching assistant. You might already have the answer in the document. Okay, on to the next one. The next one, actually, let's look at these together. These vocabulary words are semester and term. Semester and term. So a semester is six months, and a term means one period in the school year. So depending on the college or depending on the university, they might have different like calendar systems they use for their courses. So some universities use a semester system, which means every six months is a new chance to start courses. So for example, there might be a spring semester and a fall semester, or maybe a summer semester and a winter semester. So that means courses are for six months at a time. So you take the same lessons every day or every week for six months, you finish it, and at the end of the semester, at the end of the six month period, you have a break and then you start a new semester, a new course, a new group of courses. So a semester is a six month period. Some universities operate on a semester system. For example, winter semester is starting soon. Then a term, a term means one period in the school year. So a semester can be a term. So one period could be six months. So we have two terms in the school year, so two semesters. However, you may find, it's actually very common, for some universities to have like three terms or four terms, like one term for each season. So they don't use a semester system. They have like three terms or four terms. So there might be like a spring term and a summer term and an autumn term and a winter term in your university. You might find something like that. So a term refers to the period of time for a course. For example, our university uses a four-term system. So that means in one year, in one academic year, in one college or university calendar year, there are four periods for study. Okay, let's go to the next word, which is quiz. Quiz. A quiz is a small test of knowledge. So quiz is something that's usually not really, really important for your grade, but it's like a small test of your knowledge to make sure you understand the things you're studying in your class. For example, 
I had a pop quiz today. Pop quiz today. Pop quiz refers to a surprise quiz. Pop means like sudden or surprise. A pop quiz means you didn't have any information about it. Your teacher or your instructor decided to give the students a quiz with no chance to prepare. So it's like, what do you know now? You may find pop quizzes in some of your classes in colleges and universities. So let's compare quiz to exam or examination. An exam or an examination, we use exam because examination is long. Uh, an exam is a large test of knowledge. We typically in university level courses have two exams. We have a midterm exam and a final exam. So I just use the word midterm. So midterm means in the middle of the period. So for example, in the middle of spring term, I'll have a midterm exam. So that means this term, this period is halfway finished. We're going to have a test of knowledge, a midterm. So mid refers to middle, a midterm exam and a final exam. So final exam refers to a test that happens at the end of the course. It is the final test of your knowledge from that course. For example, we need to study for the final exam. Okay, the next word is thesis, thesis. A thesis is a document that students prepare in order to graduate and receive a degree. So many universities and colleges require a thesis. So you need to make a topic of study or you need to choose a topic of study to write a document about and give a presentation about to your instructors and they'll decide if you get a degree or not based on your work. So depending on the university, uh, there may be different requirements. You may not have to prepare a thesis document, a big thesis document for a bachelor's degree or there may be some different requirements. But a thesis is a very common thing that many students need to prepare in order to graduate. So it's common for a thesis to be a paper document and to be a presentation. You need to present your ideas to the instructors at your university in your department. For example, what's your thesis title? So we choose a title for our research or a title for our topic. Okay. The next word I've mentioned is degree, a degree. A degree is a certification of knowledge in a subject from a college or a university. So a degree is physically the paper, the paper certificate you receive after you finish a four-year course of study or more if you go to graduate school. So a degree is like the thing you receive at the end of your studies. For example, I finally got my degree. I finally got my degree. All right, the last group here, these are types of degrees. So after four years of study at a college or university, you'll receive what's called a BA or a BS in most cases. So BA stands for Bachelor of Arts. BS stands for Bachelor of Science. So there are these two groups. If you study something that's in the arts, so that means humanities, maybe something that's more creative, you'll receive a Bachelor of Arts. If you study something in the sciences, so like chemistry, physics, biology, math, you'll receive a Bachelor of Science. So depending on the type of study you do, you'll receive one of these two. We call this a bachelor's degree, a bachelor's degree, a four-year degree typically. The next type of degree, the next step up, is called a master's degree. A master's degree is something you get by attending graduate school. So after you finish four years, you decide to continue your studies, you attend a graduate school, and typically a master's program, a master's degree, requires maybe about two additional years of study. So that means six total years of study in order to get a master's degree. You may also hear this just called a master's, similar to bachelor's degree, which we often just call a bachelor's. I got my bachelor's in something, or uh, he got his master's in architecture. So when you want to introduce the topic of your study or the title of your department maybe, you use in. 
in, a master's in architecture, or she has a BA in linguistics. So linguistics means like the study of language. So we use the preposition in after our degree uh, and before the topic of study. Finally, PhD. PhD is the highest level of certification you can receive. So PhD means doctor of philosophy, or we also call it a doctorate. So doctor of philosophy is the highest level of certification you can receive. And yes, philosophy is in the title, but that doesn't mean like your topic of study is philosophy. It just means you have the highest level of recognized knowledge in that subject. So we can use PhD as a title and we can use it to talk about our degree. For example, she's a PhD. So that means she's a doctor of philosophy and we usually include like the subject or the, the topic of study that she received a PhD for. So she's a PhD or he has a PhD in economics. So we can use both of these patterns, he has or she is. So both of those are commonly used to talk about people with PhDs. So a PhD often takes a lot of time. It can take after a master's degree, which is maybe six years, it can maybe take another two years to maybe even up to eight years to receive a PhD. So like medical doctors receive PhDs. It takes a very long time and in many cases a lot of money uh, in order to get a PhD. So these are some very important keywords that you can use when talking about colleges and universities and your studies. So I hope that this was helpful for you. Of course, if you know some other words that are important to use in colleges, universities, and so on, please feel free to share those in the comments. And also please feel free to make some sentences with these vocabulary words too. Of course, if you have any other questions or comments or anything else, please feel free to let us know about those as well. If you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about the present progressive tense in English. Let's get started. First, I want to talk about the primary uses, the main ways we use the present progressive tense or the present continuous tense. You might also hear it called that. First, we use present progressive tense to express temporary actions and conditions. So a temporary action or a temporary condition is something that happens or is a condition that is true for a short period of time. With present progressive tense, it's something temporary, something that is true now, at this point in time. So not in the past, that's what we use past progressive to talk about. And we don't use it to talk about the future either. Present progressive refers to temporary actions and conditions that are true now and that are going to like finish at some point in time. We also use present progressive to express a future planned action. We use this in exactly the same way as we use going to or not going to. So if you want some more information about point two, I recommend you check the simple future tense video on our channel or on our website. You'll find some more information about future tense with going to and a little bit about this use of present progressive tense too. In this lesson, I'm going to focus on use number one. So talking about temporary actions. Let's talk about how we make sentences and questions with this grammar point. First, let's look at making statements. So making simple statements. When we make positive statements, the pattern we use is this. We use subject, then next is the be verb, Next is the verb, our present progressive tense verb, and we add ing to the end of the verb, so the verb in the ing form. Please keep in mind that depending on your subject, the form of be will change. Let's look at some examples. First, I am teaching, a very basic sentence. My subject is I, 
My B verb is am. So when the subject is I, my B verb needs to be am to match this subject. Then teaching. So here the verb is teach. The ing form, the present progressive form, is teaching. So I am teaching refers to my actions now, my actions that are true now. In this moment, I am teaching. Soon, after this lesson, I will not be teaching. So this is a temporary situation, a temporary action. Let's look at another example. You are watching. So watching this video. You is my subject. Are is the form of the be verb I need to use. So because my subject is you, the be verb has to be are. You are. We use these as a pair. It's a set, uh, a set phrase. Finally, watching. So my verb here is watch. In the ing form, it's watching. You are watching. So again, this is a temporary condition, a temporary action. It's true now. So in this moment, your current state or your current action is watching this video. So when this video finishes, you will not be watching this video. It is a temporary action. Okay, so let's compare this to negative statements. To make a negative statement, uh, we follow a very similar pattern to the positive pattern. We use subject plus be, and then we use not before the verb in the ing form. So some examples. He is not listening. He is not listening. Here my subject is he. My be verb is is, is. So when the subject of the sentence is he or she or it, the be verb changes to is. I've used not, so this makes the, ne the negative form of the sentence. And my verb is listen. I've used listening in the ing form. He is not listening. So maybe someone in your house or someone nearby you watching this video or maybe not watching this video is not listening to the video or she is not listening. So this is an action that is not happening now. So sometimes we want to talk about that. For example, I am not sitting. I am standing right now. So if we want to talk about something that is not true and that is temporary, we can do it with a sentence pattern like this. One more example, they are not helping. So my subject is they. My be verb is are. So just as we used with you are, they are. We also use are when the subject is they. Not helping. So help is my verb. The ing form is helping. They are not helping. So again, this is a temporary situation. In this moment, they, those people over there, are not helping. So maybe we want them to help. So we might ask them, please help us or something. We want to express this current negative condition. So this is how we do it, by using a negative sentence pattern. Let's now look at how to make some questions. So first I want to look at how we make information questions. So we use WH questions at the beginning of this pattern, like who, what, where, when, why, how, and so on. So we're trying to get some information. So we use our WH question. We use the be verb, then our subject and our verb in the ING form. For example, what are you doing? A very common question, a very common question and good to know. What are you doing? So again, our subject is you. This matches with are. Our be verb must be are to match with the subject you. And do is my verb in the ing form doing. What are you doing at native speed? You might also hear this part become very short. So instead of what are you doing, you might hear what you doing, what you doing. This is a very natural way to express this, especially in American English. Okay, one more example. Where are they going? Where are they going? So again, my subject here is they. Again, the be verb is are. 
Here, where? So this is a question about a place, in this case, a destination. Where are they going? This means the action is happening now. They are traveling in some way, maybe walking or driving or flying. So the action is happening now. That's what this progressive form shows us. So here, the listener is doing something. There's an action happening now. The speaker wants to know what it is. In this example sentence, they, so some people, are traveling somewhere. The speaker wants to know where the destination is. Okay, let's compare this to yes or no questions. So these are questions we can answer with a simple yes or no response. When we want to make a yes or no question, we begin with is or are. Again, this depends on the subject, so we need to think about the subject of the sentence and choose the correct form of the be verb to match. We then follow it with a verb in the ing form and, as you'll see, some extra information often, too. For example, is he working right now? Is he working right now? And are you listening to me? So we can answer both of these with yes or no to answer. So is he working right now? Yes. You can make a full sentence and say, yes, he's working right now. But in most cases, we just say yes. With this question, are you listening to me? You can again answer with yes or probably not no, because if you are not listening to me, you probably won't hear the question. Please note, uh, in some cases, when we're talking to ourselves, like there's no other person in the room, we might ask ourselves a yes or no question. And in that case, we would use am I in the ing form. Like, hmm, am I doing this correctly? Like you might think if you're using your computer, am I doing this correctly? Am I doing this right? So in those cases, you can use am I, yes, when you're talking to yourself. But when you're making questions with yes or no answers for other people, you'll probably use this is or are pattern, not the am I pattern. So I'll add it to the board, but just keep in mind, uh, in most cases, you'll probably use the is or are pattern when talking to other people. Okay, so let's finish this lesson by looking at a very common mistake related to the present progressive tense. Something I hear learners do a lot is they use present progressive, this grammar point, to express an action or to express a condition that is always true. So a key point with this present progressive tense is that it's a temporary action. It's not something that's true forever. It's not something that's always true. Sometimes I hear a student say this. For example, I am working in LA. I am working in LA. So when the speaker wants to share their regular workplace, this is, the in, this is an incorrect way to do it. The reason this is incorrect is because working expresses a temporary action. But if your regular workplace is in LA, you shouldn't use present progressive tense to express that. Instead, you should say, I work in LA. I work in LA, simple present tense. For more about the simple present tense, you can take a look at the simple present tense video on our YouTube channel or our website. Uh, then you can use present progressive tense to describe a temporary situation. So these two sentences are okay. I am working in LA this week. So the reason this sentence is correct is because this sentence expresses a time period, a fixed time period. This week, I'm working in LA this week, it's temporary. That case, in a case like that, it's fine. Another example, she is working in LA for the summer. So that means for this time period, the action is going to continue, the action is continuing. So we can use present progressive tense to describe this. In these cases, it's fine because we understand the time period for the action. In this case, I am working in LA. No, we cannot use it in this way. Please use simple present tense to describe regular actions and things that are always true. 
All right, so I'll finish there. If you have any questions or comments or want to practice making sentences with the present progressive tense, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Of course, if you want to ask any other questions or if you want to share some other ideas with your fellow viewers, please feel free to add those in the comment section as well. If you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye bye! Hey everyone! Welcome to the Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is the power of specificity and knowing what you want. If you don't know exactly what you want from the language you're learning, then chances are you might fail. Sounds harsh, but it's true. In fact, not being specific with what you want is the number one mistake beginner language learners make. And that's why today you'll discover how being specific transforms you into a better language learner, how to change your learning approach and speed up your progress, how to apply these tactics with our learning system, and much more. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Having a Party PDF Cheat Sheet. With this cheat sheet, you'll learn words and phrases like would you like a drink, guest, dessert, and more. And second, the Summer Season Writing Workbook. With this printable PDF, you'll learn all the must-know summer words and phrases. And you'll be able to practice writing the phrases out as well. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. And here are this month's updates for our language learning system. Learning pathways now include a journey widget, which shows your overall language learning progress, the next item widget, which shows you the next lesson to take, and your overall grade for the pathway. Just access one of your learning pathways on your dashboard to see these changes for yourself. And there's also the brand new Help Center to help answer and resolve any issues that you might have. Just click on Help Center and FAQ down in the footer menu of the site. The Power of Specificity and Knowing What You Want Part 1. The Power of Specificity Think back for a second. Was there something you really wanted to buy when you were a kid that you had to save up for? Maybe a game or a toy? Chances are you eventually got it, and the main reason you were able to get it is because you knew exactly how much you needed to save, and it was a matter of time until you saved up for it. So what does this have to do with learning a language? Well, because you had a specific price to aim for, you were being specific about what you wanted. This kind of specificity is a powerful way to reach almost any goal, including learning a language. How exactly? For example, think about the kind of New Year's resolutions that people set every January. Resolutions like, I want to learn a language, or I want to become fluent. These goals tend to be very vague and unrealistic, right? And these same people quit one week into January. But it's much easier and faster to reach more specific goals. Goals like speak for three minutes in your target language, or learn 100 words in a month. Why? That's because you define the progress. You know exactly what you're looking for. Three minutes, 100 words. Kind of like the price of that one thing you really wanted as a child. So having that specific number in mind is crucial, and you'll always think about it. You'll always know how far off you are and when you'll hit it. Whereas becoming fluent someday, well, what does that even mean? And how would you even know you reached it? It's hard to be obsessed with a goal when there's no specific point to aim for. So without a specific number, you'll never know what you're aiming for. And this brings us to the second point. Part two, the power of knowing what you want. Do you know what you want from the language? Think about that for a second. You might be tempted to say, yes, I just want to speak and understand everything. But you're still being vague, which is the number one sign of not knowing what you want. 
And the truth is, most beginners don't know what they want from the language either, aside from some vague goals. They'll get a textbook, download an app, and watch YouTube videos, just passively take things in, but their progress will be slow. They're not looking for anything specific, so nothing really sticks except for a few words. But let's say you wanted to know how to introduce yourself in that target language, so you know what you want. And then it's just a matter of mastering all the phrases for introductions. You'll learn it fairly fast. Same thing if you want to be able to talk about your family. Same thing if you want to master a specific grammar point that you still don't quite get. And once you've mastered this specific piece, you can go on to the next one, and you end up mastering more and more of your target language, all because you're being specific and know what you want. Now, all of this sounds simple, but it's not a beginner tactic. It's something that comes to you with time and experience. As mentioned, most beginners don't know what they want and rely on their apps and textbooks to guide them instead. That's just how we all learn as beginners. We don't know enough to start asking questions. But there are ways you can start being specific and intentional about your approach. Again, one of the best ways to make progress in your target language is to define what that progress is and be super specific about it. For example, learning 100 words in a month, speaking three minutes in your target language, or mastering a specific grammar point so you can use it freely in conversation. And the reason for that is, because you have a specific goal or number, you know exactly what to look for, whether it's reaching 100 words or three minutes. And without a specific number, you'll never know what you're aiming for. So if you want to get a bit more specific with your learning, here are a few things you can do. Part three. How to apply these tactics. One, set small, measurable monthly goals. For example, learn 100 words in one month. Finish 30 lessons inside of our learning pathway in one month. Send one message a day to your Premium Plus teacher. All of these are specific. Two, ask questions and note down specific points you don't quite get. The fact is, you'll always come across words or grammar patterns that you don't quite get. So note them down and ask questions whenever possible. This will help you come up with specific items you'd want to tackle or master within the language. You can always ask us in the comment section of the lessons or your Premium Plus teacher if you're a Premium Plus member. Three, similar to number two, if you're learning with an actual teacher, always prepare a question to ask, even if you can't think of a good one. This puts you in the habit of being proactive and looking for specific points you want to learn, clarify, or practice. Otherwise, it's like coming to class, taking notes, and leaving, and then forgetting it all later. Four, take time to think about what you'd like to accomplish specifically with the language. For example, if you're learning for a specific reason, like travel, then give yourself specific goals, like learn how to ask about prices or ask for directions. It doesn't have to be anything big. In fact, the smaller and more specific it is, the better. If you want to learn the language but are still struggling with making time to sit down and learn and making language learning a routine, there is a quick two-minute solution to your problem. The two-minute hack for learning and easily sticking with it. And in this guide, you'll discover one, the two-minute rule and why that's all you need to get a routine going, two, how to learn the language in just a few minutes a day, three, which language tools you can use, including free ones, and much more. But first, if you don't yet have access to our language learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. So, why are two minutes all you need to get started? First, you may already be thinking that two minutes aren't enough to learn anything. And you're not wrong, but that's not what the two minute rule is all about. The two minute rule comes from the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. And the way it goes is, if you want to form a new habit or routine, you should do it for just two minutes a day. Why? 
Well, those two-minute rules are all about practicing showing up and making language learning super easy to start. So pick something easy that you can do for two minutes. And we'll reveal a few ways you can learn for just two minutes in just a bit. If you can show up and put in two easy minutes consistently, you now have a routine that you can improve upon. Now you can learn a bit more challenging things past those two minutes, and now you have a solid routine going. In other words, the two minutes act like a gateway routine. Do the easy stuff for two minutes. If you can master showing up and doing two minutes, then you can move on to the more challenging things like grammar, reading, or drilling vocabulary. But if you never master showing up, you'll be like the millions of language learners that set a New Year's resolution and failed it three days later. Now, how can you put in just two minutes a day? If you're learning with our system, you can. This is a free service that sends you new words every day, improves your vocabulary, and you can easily spend two minutes reading through the word, the examples, listening to the pronunciation, and saying it out loud. Not quite two minutes, but it comes close. Our three-minute lessons are a lesson series for absolute beginners, where you learn conversational phrases in just three minutes and start speaking the language right away. And you'll find the pathway for these lessons in our lesson library. Just look for vocabulary lists in the vocabulary drop-down menu on the site. You'll find hundreds of lists for common topics like greetings, talking about weather, everyday life, must-know phrases for conversations, and much more. And you can spend two minutes picking up new words or saying them out loud. The dialogue tracks are 10 to 30 second tracks with just the lesson conversation. So if you want to listen to native conversations or just review a conversation from a previous lesson, you can easily spend two minutes listening to one on repeat or several and train your ear and get accustomed to native speech. We email out freebie cheat sheets every month, so if you're on our email list, you should be getting them. And just spend two minutes reviewing the words and phrases on the cheat sheets. These cheat sheets are a great way to learn a bit of language in just a few minutes a day. So, if you want to learn the language and get access to these learning tools and our learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. If you're learning the language, then you already know that spaced repetition flashcards help you learn words fast. But what if you used them for phrases and sentences too? You'd be able to speak way more, because that's how we all speak, through phrases and sentences. How to boost your conversations with spaced repetition flashcards. And in this guide, you'll discover how to do just that. You'll learn where to unlock hundreds of free phrase lists, how to master phrases fast with spaced repetition flashcards, and bonus learning tricks built into our flashcards. But first, if you don't yet have access to our language learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. So, if you want to master sentences and phrases for conversations with spaced repetition, the best places to start are our free vocabulary and phrase lists, which you can find in the vocabulary drop-down menu on the site. Just look for lists that contain phrases such as the 10 lines you need to introduce yourself, top conversational phrases, daily routines, and much more. Then select all the phrases, click Add Selected Words to Flashcards, and then New Deck to create a flashcard deck for these phrases. You'll need premium access or a free lifetime account with our free seven-day premium trial. Now, in the same vocabulary drop-down menu, go to Flashcards, and you'll see your deck. Just press Study to start drilling the phrases. And the way spaced repetition flashcards work is, they track your progress and space out your learning over time. So if you know a phrase now, the flashcards will show it again in two days, then four days, then eight days, and so on. 
Once you're done with a study session, that's it for the day. And all of this takes just a few minutes. Then your flashcards will remind you when to study again and start introducing new phrases while spacing out the ones you already know so that you never forget the phrases. And so you're actually mastering the phrases that you can use in actual conversation instead of just learning words. With our flashcards, you can test yourself on how well you can remember or produce the phrase, read it, or understand it. So, if you go to settings, you can choose from listening comprehension, where you hear the phrase and the goal is to see if you understand it, production, where you see the translation and the goal is to see if you can remember and produce the phrase, and recognition, where you see the phrase in the target language and the goal is to see if you're able to recall the meaning. You can pick one, two, or all three. Practice multiple skills to get the phrases to stick even better. So, if you want to learn the language and get access to these learning tools and our learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. If you want to learn the language fast, there are some little known learning hacks that you can use with our system. Five learning hacks that you didn't know about. And in this quick guide, you'll discover one, how to understand and pick up on every word with the read along method. Two, how to improve your speaking and pronunciation with one tool. Three, how to immerse yourself in native dialogues and much more. But first, if you don't yet have access to our language learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. Ever listen to a conversation between native speakers and wish you could follow along with a transcript? Well, you can. In fact, listening and reading along is a popular learning hack for mastering a language. You pick up on every word, you improve your listening skills, reading skills, and engage multiple senses at once, which improves recall. And you can do just that with our lessons. On every lesson page, you get the complete word-for-word -word transcript to read along with. Shadowing is another popular language learning trick, and it's where you repeat what you hear as a way to improve your speaking skills. So as you're taking our lessons, you can shadow the lesson conversation, and you can do this easily with the line-by-line -line audio dialogue, which breaks up the conversation into individual lines. Just press play on the audio to listen and then repeat. You can also use the pronunciation practice tool to compare yourself to native speakers. Just press the microphone icon, record yourself speaking the line, and then you can hear how your pronunciation compares to the native speaker. The dialogue tracks give you just the conversation of the lessons, no translations, so that you can review the conversations without retaking lessons. And if you're learning with our app, you can just set the dialogue tracks on autoplay and immerse yourself in different types of dialogues, boost your listening skills, and drill all the conversations into your brain. Just go into the settings on the app, and in autoplay, make sure autoplay is on. Turn on dialogue, turn off the other tracks, also set play next lessons to on, and the app will do the rest for you. Now, if you're not sure whether you're getting the most out of the lesson or not, well, if you follow our lesson checklists, you'll walk away knowing more of the language guaranteed. This premium PDF can be found inside the PDF download section of the lesson and gives you bonus tips to follow. Just print out the checklist and fill it out with every lesson. The word bank is kind of like your extended brain, where you can save words and phrases that you come across to the word bank, so you review them later. Just look for the word bank in the vocabulary menu on the site. But what's cool is you can also create printable study sheets for your words and phrases as well. Just click on Printer Friendly Version. You can also click Export Word Bank. If you've organized and labeled your words into categories, such as verbs and adjectives, you can select that label and export it as a PDF. Then print the file out. You can write on it and keep it as physical study material. So, if you want to learn the language and get access to these learning tools and our learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. Great work. Here's a reward. 
Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.